Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Cordwell. I'm the programmer at the Melbourne International Film Festival. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Welcome to Peter Strickland in Conversation, a MIF Talks event. This year, the MIF Talks program is presented by the University of Melbourne Faculty of Fine Arts and Music. For information on other events, please do visit miff.com.au forward slash talks. Peter Strickland is a British filmmaker who has become one of the most acclaimed and distinctive voices in contemporary cinema. He is one of Miff's three directors in focus this year and we are thrilled to be screening his four narrative feature films, including his latest film, In Fabric, as well as short films and a special program of retrospective titles that he has personally chosen himself. Today, Peter will speak about his career influences and cinephilia to Alexandra Helen Nicholas, a widely published film critic, author, programming consultant and academic. Alex's many credits include co-programming at the pioneering women program for MIF in 2017, co-editing at the recent Census of Cinema MIF dossier, The Analogues of Peter Strickland, and writing a catalogue essay for a stage adaptation of Peter's film, Barbarian Sound Studio. I am thrilled that she's the person doing this event with us today, and I'm thrilled to have Peter here as well. Welcome to you both. Over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Well, for those of you who caught in fabric yesterday, um, you'll be pleased to see I'm wearing my, my good luck dress. So nothing can possibly go wrong. I'm sure I haven't cursed things at all. Um, this is how we're going to roll today. It's because I've got post-it notes. See, I've come prepared. This might not work, so we're just going to go kind of free and easy here. Um, Peter, we've been fortunate enough. Peter has programmed um, a really extraordinary series um, of films, of, of feature films and short films um, that are, have been um, inspirations to him in different ways. There's a beautiful blog post on the MIF website where he talks about these films. Um, what I'm thinking we might do is talk a little bit about these, but also bounce that off uh, Peter's own filmography. So Peter's, particularly his four features. So we have uh, Kataman Varga, Berberian Sound Studio, Duke of Burgundy, and In Fabric. Um, the films that he's programmed are Paul Morrissey's Trash from 1970, uh, Yuri Hertz's The Cremator from 1969, and Shadows of Our Forgotten Ancestors, the Sergei Parajanov film from 1965. Um, and a bunch of shorts that are all amazing. Um, I'm very much working on the assumption, because a lot of these haven't played yet, we're working on the assumption that um, not everybody will have seen everything, uh, including Peter's own films, because some of these haven't played yet either. So our goal, I guess, is to, uh, for those of you who have seen them, to maybe uh, deepen your engagement with, with Peter's filmography and, and his practice. Um, and with these other films, perhaps to excite you or interest you in seeing them. And just what I find really interesting is just the way that art can feed other art. I think that that's one of the, one of the most exciting things. So I'm going to start off, before we get into these films, um, there's a line in uh, this, I hope I don't ramble too much here, there's a line that I'm obsessed with from In Fabric, where Miss Luckmore refers to um, the change room as the transformational sphere and I heard this and it was like at the cinema screen just ran up and gave me a high five because that's precisely how I think of your films. They're like <laughs> these little bubbles, these little trans sort of almost like kind of a shamanic energy, these little bubbles of transformation. Um, and I think it's really interesting, film critics, my, my people, we have a nasty habit of having a very clinical approach to... Um, uh, unity in a filmmaker's work. So, you know, the auteur theory, Pauline Kael turning in her grave, you know, but we like to do the kind of mathematical, this is how they all link up. And for me, the problem with that is that it excludes our experience as audiences. You know, the time in our lives where we see films, the order that we might not see them in the order that they came out, we pull films together in different ways. So I'm curious, Peter, how do you, how do you, to kick things off, how do you how do you see your own body of work? Do you see it as unified? Does it need to be unified? Um, I think it is by the nature of anyone writing and directing their own work. <laughs> I think the key is that you're writing it and directing it. Um, had I taken someone else's work, I'm not. I don't know. I mean, obviously, 
people like Belatar, he doesn't write his own scripts, but um, but I don't, you know, with each film, you don't know what's going to happen next. You know, when I made The Duke of Burgundy, I had, there was no seed for In Fabric. Um, but I think with each film, the more you do, the more you're aware of what you've done in, in the past. And that, that's dangerous sometimes. Um, this whole ASMR thing, this, or I don't know, I just, I'm assuming everyone knows, but autonomous sensory meridian response, this tactile response to sounds, that I wasn't aware of it until, until someone uh, asked me after the Duke of Burgundy. So sometimes doing things consciously can be, I don't know, a bit too knowing. Um, I wasn't aware, I should have been aware that each, each film of mine has someone being ignored on the street. Um, <laughs> is that your I authorial think, stamp? I think my only, my only conscious stamp is Fatma Mohammed and suitcases. I have the same suitcases because I was, a, I was into this idea with Sam Raimi. He always had the same, I think he had the same car in all his films. <laughs> um, but these are really old antique suitcases and um, carrying them around Europe, it's kind of precarious. So it's not a great thing to do, but anyway. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess you just do these things and just the nature of any human being making something, you put your stamp on it. It's nothing, I think anything, any more exertion than that becomes a bit contrived if you're not, if you're not careful. It's what I find that I really um, connect within your films is this tension between... Um, I, we start off with this little window of something, not, not I, I, I use the term very loosely, but not reality as such, but we start in a relatively familiar place and we sort of move into this sort of increasingly abstracted zone. There's this transformation into some kind of abstraction. Um, and it's always, the films are very different, but I always have this similar experience of that kind of journey, um, but in very different, in very mm -hmm. different ways. Um, and what I find so interesting is um, a lot of the films that you've chosen have similar... I guess there's a similar tension between the usual and the unusual. Yeah, and the familiar and the, and the unfamiliar. I mean, with the, um, again, I didn't, I didn't think about this until recently. The, um, with the Duke of Burgundy, that was um, finding the familiar in the unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. And in Fabric was the opposite, finding the unfamiliar in this very familiar world of the high street. Um, but I guess... I think the appeal for me as, as, as someone who loves film um, is to um, pretty much what you were saying about tra transformation, just immersing oneself in, in, in this world. And um, maybe it's just because I'm lazy and don't like do, I don't like doing research. So you just make this <laughs> artificial world and you don't have to worry about, you know, <laughs> checking things, you know. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. The Russian formalists have a term that they uh, used a lot to talk about art, which is defamiliarization. But there's a much more fun Italian theorist called Carlo Ginzburg who just calls it making things strange. And I, I think about the Ginzburg, that, mm -hmm. that act as a kind of artistic practice or method a lot with your films um, in that things that we think... Duke of Burgundy, I think, is a great ca case in point in that we think we know what's going on mm -hmm. and then we don't know what's going on and we're actually given something quite different than what we think it is from the start. Well, yeah, I mean, that was, I mean, the beginning of a Duke was trying to start it like, um, I guess, your typical sexploitation film with this kind of sadomaso, as we call it in Europe, this kind of scenario, um, or even not that. People thought it was a genuine maid being treat treated badly. Uh, but for me, it was like this sadomasochistic situation that just turned on, on its head. And um, But for me, you know, that was a very logical film. It was um, taking sexual role play, which is always done as this fantasy that can't be punctured in film usually, which is fine. I mean, I, that, 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 I'm not, I'm not criticizing that, but I thought, why don't we just look at that really logically? And what if somebody, you know, the, the reluctant dominant, really, that mm -hmm. was fascinating for me and putting on a persona, um, the fear of performance. And you're just trying to take both points of view. Um, so who should compromise? Should if someone who has these desires, um, should they repress them and hold them back? Or should the, other, should the other person, you know, do they have to put on a persona to be someone they're not? So I mean, I'm not trying to give the answers to that, but it's, um, and it, it goes way beyond that very specific thing in the Duke of Burgundy. It goes to, you know, having kids, work, the city, you know, or, or, you know in terms of city versus the countryside. And 
could go on forever, really. Um, but I wanted to, to kind of start off with, 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 with water sports, really. Um, partly because I just, you know, you look at the audience and I think, oh, maybe you and you and you are into <laughs> it and nobody else is into it. So most people were like thinking, I'm, I'm not into this, I don't want to watch it. And then actually, oh, actually, I do, this, I get this now. So, um, yeah. For those of you who have not seen The Duke of Burgundy yet, <laughs> um, it's, it's a beautiful film. It's a really beautiful film um, about two women um, in a relationship. There's a great quote from you. You called it a sad love story about two people who love each other but can't find the same voltage. And I think that's a beautiful, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> beautiful description. I want to be the one to tell you this because it's um, the, the quote on the Australian DVD release was, the thinking person's Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm I sorry. I want it. you to hear it from a friend. I, I, um, I'm, I quite liked it. I apologise on behalf of my nation. <laughs> it's really weird because my film came out at the same time, so the press, without, I had no control over this. They kind of created this whole rivalry between the two films, <laughs> and there was the, the Duke camp, there was the Fifty Shades camp, uh, and I hadn't seen That's it. That's a gang um, warfare film. I would pay to uh, see. <laughs> this is writing itself. Um, I hadn't seen Fifty Shades, and I, I saw it eventually. And um, I went to Bond, was just like, whatever, you can take it or leave it. But as a kind of Mills and Boone kind of entertaining love story, it was fine, you mm -hmm. know. Um, quite liked it. It's the not thinking person's Duke of Burgundy. I, <laughs> I hate that thinking person. I know, it's, it's awful, really, isn't it? Um, um, it, makes I, me, it makes me not want to watch something. When, when someone says it's a thinking person, it's right, I'm not watching that. It's like, I don't want to be that person. Yeah. <laughs> I keep, when I was writing my notes, um, my <laughs> predictive text on my phone kept changing it to Duke of Burglary. Oh, wow. And that's, okay. I think that's how I'm going to think of this <laughs> film from now on. If you haven't seen it, it's, um, I mean, I think one of the strengths of this film is its cast. We have, um, you have to correct my pronunciations, we have Chiara Diana as Evelyn. She was in Berberian Sound mm -hmm. Studio. Uh, Sidse Babak Knudsen, she's in Borgen, um, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. She also models the dress, I believe, she in, does. Uh, in she fabric. Yeah, it's a wonderful does. cameo. It I is. I saw her in the, in the credits, so and I was like, where is she? And it's like, oh, look, there she is <laughs> in the catalogue. No, she was very, gra very gracious in doing that. Um, it's quite rare to get a, you know, an actor of her calibre to just mm -hmm. appear in an unspoken cameo. So it was, it was great that she agreed. And Fatma Mohammed, our Miss Luckmore. Yeah, um, well... So that's um, your, fourth, your fourth film with her? My fourth plus one short, yeah. Cobbler's which, Lot. Cobbler's Lot. Mm, which um, I think, for those of you who saw it, you, uh, in Fabric yesterday, you would have seen Cobbler's Lot, which was part of um, the anthology, The Field Guide to Evil, mm -hmm. which was produced by Ant Timpson, who's also one of the festival guests this year. That's based on a Hungarian fairy tale, is that correct? Mm, kind of. <laughs> um, there are no shoes in this fairy tale. Um, you added the shoes. I went for the whole foot fetish thing, like 100%. <laughs> it was like 0% in the original. No, it was, um, it was a story about two brothers vying for the love of, of a princess. Um, they were, I think, they were princes themselves, and they were not lowly. Um, but it was a very long, long story, and it had other men got involved. And um, so I, 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 the rivalry was really interesting for me with, with the brothers. and. Um, but what I bought into it was was the you know the feet, the shoes, and this temptation with this um, forest pool with these nymphs, where he um, kind of gets more more than he bargained for. Yeah, it has a really striking, really really striking visual style. It reminded me a lot of um, Tales of Hoffman. Oh, oh, that was totally an influence. That totally, was, yeah. Yeah, it has that beautiful, mm -hmm. just the color, but also this sort of quite ethereal glow to it that that I think Pal and Presburger really captured with Tales of Hoffman in particular. Yeah, Tales of Hoffman and the Red Shoes, absolutely. Um, I mean, it was tough. We, 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 had, we had a good budget, but we had two days to shoot it, so mm -hmm. it was... But I Butler does it. a lot of theatre, is that right? So she, she does. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Fabric, she went back and forth to Transylvania three times. Right. So she was exhausted. And I gave her those lines. She was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Um, she delivers them immaculately. She does, like, but... Uh, it's the most quotable film that's impossible to quote. It's <laughs> <laughs> good work. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I felt, I felt quite bad, you know, that putting through that. Um, but it was just a very busy time of year for her, and we really, really wanted to have her in the film. So we made it work, you know, but, yeah, back and forth to Romania a lot. I think for a lot of us that are familiar with your films and those of you who have yet to see Duke of Burgundy, uh, Fatma Mohammed found a place in our hearts as the carpenter of the, <laughs> of the P-Box, 
Uh, we were talking about water sports. You were talking about the water sports. The toilet dungeon, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she's, it's such a, um, it's a scene that really could have gone either way. And I think that she gives it a gravitas as the carpenter of this water sport equipment in the Duke of Burgundy. I, I don't know how she did that scene. I don't know, because on paper, nobody liked that scene, really. Um, uh, I mean, I think the finances won't, won't, mind, won't mind my saying this, but um, they were like, you can't do this. Um, <laughs> but when they saw it, they loved it. Um, I just said, you know, just let me do it, it'll be fine. Um, but a, a lot of things happened by accident. Um, I wrote a whole other scene in the bedroom when she's measuring the bed and it's mm -hmm. very ex ex expositional. And I rehearsed it with the actors and oh, it was all right. Um, then I, I, I often play music to, to the actors on set just to warm them up. So I was playing, um, is it Giuseppe De Lorca? Um, Dorian Gray. Anyway, oh, it was. Um, yep. And I just saw the way Fatma was moving with this tape measure. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. And um, I thought, actually, you don't need this dialogue. Just throw it in the bin and recycling bin, I should add. And um, I just played some music. And sh they just moved to that. I didn't play that one. But, um, I played. Is it the Black Betty of the Tarantula? The mm. Morricone one? Mm -hmm. I played that one. Um, so when Rachel. And Faris did the soundtrack. I mean, that's the only one that was loosely referencing that Morricone track because everything else they, it was important. They did something quite original. Um, but yeah, I mean, she transformed that scene really because on paper people were saying, "Oh, this is a bit vulgar. This is a bit loudy, a bit smutty." Um, and then, you know, uh, but really, I, I, again, it, it's you don't want to be. Um, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a balance because you, you want to show the humor in things. I think that's just a, that's just that, that's just being human. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to laugh at people. You know, it's it's a it's a hundred percent valid. Um, I think the way around that was to normalise it, to say, well, everyone's into this. Mm -hmm. If you want to buy a toilet box, you can have to wait a bloody long time, um, and then you kind of accept it. You know, but I'm not judging those characters. I what, mean, what I like about that is that it, it's because there's such a demand for the carpenter's services for the <laughs> for the pee box. It's like, yeah, it's it's every you know your neighbours all want one of these. Monica Swin from the <laughs> Jess oh, Franco yeah, films yeah. has probably got one in her house who plays the neighbour. You know, I love that, that it's... That indiscretion, yeah. which I'm very familiar with. There's um, no weirdness yes, there. Um, it's like everybody wants one of these. You know, they're the thing to have. Yeah, no, I mean, that's my favourite part of the film and she just casually mentions one, one of the neighbours who has the, um, the bondage bed. Um, so anyway, I just... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yeah. You mentioned, um, um, was it the... Uh, you mentioned a giallo film, and, and I guess that's going to take us to Berberian mm -hmm. Sound Studio, um, which we should probably chat about. People, since that film, people really see you as a neo gialli. Mm -hmm. Like that's a, it's. I've seen work that's I don't see as giallo related, but people label it as linked to giallo. I mean, what's your what's your <laughs> relationship to giallo? Uh, How well, did you discover it? Let's do this. Yeah, <laughs> sure. It'll take a long time because it comes in spurts. Um, but yeah, let's, 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 let's attempt at doing it. So I first heard of Argento in the Kim Newman book, Nightmare Movies, mm -hmm. in 1989. But you couldn't really see that stuff then. Then I read a few paragraphs and that was it. Then at the Scala Cinema in London, which was this kind of very dank underground cinema, they had a night with these bands. They had Huggy Bear... Uh, in Stereolab, and Tim did the soundtrack to in Fabric. Um, he's no longer, well, actually, he's back in Stereolab, but anyway, that's another story. Um, and they played after The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that sounds amazing, just that title. And I couldn't go that night, but this sound and this, this whole thing stayed in my head. And I saw it on VHS in 94. But I got into the Morricone soundtracks around 97, and then a big barber season at the National Film Theatre in 2000, no, mm -hmm. 1998, two month season. Um, then I really lapped, I lapped things up around that time. But Baron, they're jello elements, but it's more supernatural mm -hmm. horror. I mean, I, I, like many people, I didn't know the difference. I just thought everything was jello. Anything that came from Italy was, anything with blood was jello, but there are these very defined differences, you know, Poliziotteschi and. Jallo and Supernatural. I'm sure there are other things as well, other, other sub-genres. But um, the problem with Barbarian was after that, the Duke of 
that, that was called Jello. And it's like, no, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a yeah. romance. Yep. It's, a, it's a romantic film. It's, no, nothing, it's not a thriller. Um, and Fabric got called Jello, um, which I get it. I understand. It has colour in it. It's the flamboyance. Yeah, yeah. And I was trying to work out why does it keep coming up? Um, is it just colour? Because people say the same thing about Refn as well. It's like, oh, he uses colour. It's so Argento. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I for know. me, I mean, I was just, because my attraction to Jello, I mean, I don't, I don't really enjoy pe pe people suffering in film. So mm. for me, the attraction was the atmosphere, the music, the flamboyance, which, which I, I, I just lapped it up. Those um, titles. I mean, the very... The, the, oh, in the, the Duke Austin, of Burgundy. Or, uh, oh, of, the, of the Gialli, like just oh, right. the titles of Gialli are just so over the top and ostentatious. Yes, and the hair. Your vice is a locked oh, yes. room and only I have the key. You know, it's beautiful. They're like and little poems, the titles. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry, yes, yes, yes. No, I mean, the, all, all those titles were... Sorry, I, my, I've just come no, up no. plain. <laughs> I thought you said tiles because... We actually spent a lot of time on the tiles on Duke of Burgundy. We <laughs> actually, there were actually stickers. I was going to say there were stickers, weren't there were they? Stickers, because it was yeah. a rundown old house. It was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I misheard It's beautiful. You. Um, <laughs> so, Bavarian Sound Studio, for those of you who haven't seen it, it starts, it starts Tony Jones as a guy called Gilderoy, who's a sound boffin, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say. And um, he gets a job at a film studio called the Bavarian Sound Studio uh, in Rome. And uh, I think it's in Rome. Is it right? Um, well, it it's Milan thing? in my mind. I don't think it's... I'll I go with Milan. I don't think it's mentioned, actually, but it was based on... Um, <coughs> excuse my Italian. Um, Studio di Phonologia, mm -hmm. which Cathy Barbarian recorded in with Luciano Berio, um, Luigi Nono, and Bruno Moderna, who did the soundtrack to Death Laid an Egg, mm -hmm. which has a lot of poultry in it. And That's where the Gilderoy... Chicken, the chicken giallo. The chicken, the chicken yeah. giallo. And where Gilderoy comes from is Dorking, and his emblem is a chicken that comes from Milan. How about that? And this is not planned. This is a coincidence. <laughs> <coughs> because I used to go past Dorking on the way. On the, when I used to get the train to Gatwick Airport, I always go past Dorking. And it looked amazing. And I just, okay, let's do something in Dorking. And it was just like, wow, this chicken comes from Milan. This, like, this emblem as you go through Dorking. Um, so it was wonderful for me. But anyway, that's just a personal <laughs> thing. But, yeah. Um, so Gilderoy turns up, and it's a difficult workplace, I think it's fair to say. Very macho, he's, yeah. He's struggling with, the, with the, the workplace environment, which is something that perhaps some of us might be familiar with. Um, and things start to... He's, he's, doing this, he's working on the sound for a very violent horror film uh, called The Equestrian Vortex. He didn't know that it was going to be a very violent horror film. And this starts having an effect on him. And I, I think here we have our transformational sphere as, as Gilderoy sort of goes on this journey. Um, but we have the wonderful... The film includes at the start these wonderful title credits. We don't see the film, The Equestrian Vortex, except for the opening title credits. Um, that's Julian House. Is that correct? Who it's his idea as well. Um, I, when I wrote the script, I didn't have that in there. You, you, just, you wouldn't see anything. And um, I approached Julian. I was a fan of his sleeve designs for, for records. At that point, he hadn't done film. Um, so we asked him just to do tape box logos and so on, and, and he read the script, and he said, had you thought about doing a title sequence? And I pretended I had. Actually, I hadn't. But, um, um, and yeah, he did that, really. It was wonderful. And it's it started a whole relationship by accident, really. I have very smoothly segued this towards one of the films that you've chosen, The Cremator. Oh, right, I yes. believe the, yeah, yeah, it was, um, yeah. the Uri Hertz film. Um, I'm not sure how many of you guys have seen this, but it's, I only cried when I saw that you'd programmed this because it's just one of my favourites. It's just a wholly unique, it's a really key film uh, in the Czech New Wave. And um, there's, there's clearly references, and, and I think you speak about this on the Myth Blog, but the... the um, Aspects of the of the Cremator opening sequences informed the yeah no, I, I, I think I don't know for sure. Um, Cerise could verify this. Um, I think Cerise, Jan. Yeah. <laughs> did oh. Jan Schwankmeyer do? Hello, nice oh. to meet you. Hi, Cerise. Did did, did Jan Schwankmeyer do the title sequence? I don't believe so, no. Right. Yeah. Good thing I didn't sort of feed everyone that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the legend um, stops here. Yes. It's over. Yeah. The myth, the lies, they end. Um, but yeah, the the Zdenek Lischka score was fantastic. I was into though, you know, because Lubosz Fischer with um, the um, Morgiana soundtrack mm -hmm. and um, Valerie in A Week of Wonders. But with well, all those directors, you know, Veda Hitilova, um, Yeremu Yiresh, Yuri Hertz, um, that was almost like a parallel. It's a very different parallel to Italy from Italy. But um, I was definitely 
the, I think the editing of the cremator was what really blew my mind. Um, this idea of showing someone reading, you know, we're here, you're reading that, there's a close-up of that, and the next wide shot is you in, a, in another space. I mean, now it's not that unusual. I saw the Queen film the other day and they had that, but... Uh, <laughs> um, I think the but focus on gestures, we were talking about the combing yes, of the hair and the, the yeah, holding, of the, back, that, yeah, the holding yeah. of the back of the neck. As the title, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, as the title suggests, The Cremator is uh, set in Prague during the 1930s uh, and it's about a supposedly perfectly happy family. Things start to take a bit of a turn um, when the cremator of the title finds himself really seduced, I think, by the increasing... Uh, Nazi dominance in the area. It's an extraordinary film. It's sort of sometimes called a drama, sometimes called a black comedy uh, with horror elements. It's, it's, it's a pretty unique film. You have a beautiful description of it. You say, both ludicrous and malevolent, the cremator is an irresistibly septic mediation on death and the hideous lure of fascism. And uh, you wrote that. You said that. That was uh, you. Meditation, but yeah. yeah Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it could be a mediation as well. You can do that. He, he's like a mediator. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's... Um, Gothic, basically, for me. It's like a, just a gothic. But, yeah, it's wonderful. I, um, a friend of mine bought it for me for Christmas. And it had a really bad design on the DVD. And I'm, I'm very fickle like that. I always go on designs. And I thought, oh, God. <coughs> then I thought, I have to just watch it just to shut him up because he kept asking me what I, what I thought about it. So, but literally from the first minute, you go, oh my God, what is this? It's, it's just, um, um, I think for those of you who aren't quite sold on this film, I do think that the opening sequence is on YouTube. Oh, right, okay. Um, uh -huh. So if you need a little taster, it's, um, you're kind of in from the word go with that film. It's, it's, um, it's, it's really, really special. Uh, is there a um, Mog Morgiana reference in Duke of Burgundy, I think you said? There the is a little, well, in just terms of the, the, the feel. Uh, there is. No, you're the right. Box, there is. There's a the box, when she's taking all these things out. Yeah, that was, sorry. It's a, there was like a lame reference, but yeah. I'm not going to hold you to it. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I love that film. And again, the, the soundtrack by Lubosz Fischer. But yeah, Beautiful. there was no, nothing beyond just, I just love the this kind of gothic melodrama. Mm. I was just massively into that. It's, it's funny watching these films, going back and revisiting these older films, um, framed through you citing them and, and programming them as such key, uh, films that had such a key impact on you or it really sent like a, just a real punch. Um, and it's almost, I have to resist doing that sort of obvious connect the dots. It's like, mm. oh, this, this is like that scene in Peter's film here. But, and I know that that can sometimes be a little bit clumsy because I don't think inspiration necessarily works that directly. But there is a scene in um, The Cremator. I think it's at a, um, a kind of Grand Guinot wax sh waxwork show. All oh, right. Okay. Um, and there's a mannequin. It's, it's, there's, there's these wax figures, um, but they're played by humans, I think. It's a really extraordinary scene. But there's a woman getting... Um, uh, sorry, there's a, a, a figurine, a, a wax figurine or a mannequin, if you will, um, kind of mechanically getting stabbed in the back, but it's a, like a little key slot. So it's very, very mm -hmm. mechanical. And I was watching that and it's like, th th there's a very famous scene, a very notorious scene in, in fabric with a, a, yeah. a bleeding mannequin <laughs> that those of you who have seen the film, um, I, is that it? I mean... I hadn't, honestly, now you mentioned it, maybe subconsciously, but... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm always hesitant um, to make those really obvious lines because I, d I don't think it works that way necessarily. Uh, I mean, with the mannequins, I mean, it came from, oh, two things. I mean, one was my childhood, um, <laughs> just going to those stores. Mm. Um, and Keenholz, the, the sculptor, who did these nightmarish mannequins with the kind of resin dripping down their faces and everything. Um, but I mean, a lot of in fabric is just um, using a, a child's perspective. And you look at a dumb waiter in a store and you're not to know where that dumb waiter goes. So maybe it does go down to this strange hell-like place. Um, the mannequins, you know, are they guardians of the store? You know, do they, how do they function? <laughs> All these kind of things. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, the cremator, I actually forgot about that scene. I'm not well, accusing maybe, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I would openly say if I had, but you know, I think a lot of these things can be subconscious, you know. Yeah, it's, knows, it, was, yeah. it was interesting kind yeah. of watching just these little, these little moments and like, oh, I've never noticed that before. Let's move on to the um, Parajanov film, Shadows of oh, Our Forgotten oh. Ancestors. Um, 
I, I guess one of the interesting things with that is in terms of the cremator, both of these filmmakers really suffered for their art, you know, in, in the context that they were making these films. Well, Panajanov, especially him. Yeah, I mean, he know, was being gay in prison and, for you know, oh God. five years, four years. I don't know how long that, does anyone know? But it, it was, he had a really rough time, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And, and that um, was really, um, I mean, he just he just wasn't going to toe the Soviet realism line, is my understanding, is that he was wanting to do his own thing, and that, that just kind of didn't, that was never the explicit reason, but that was like, your art is sort of deviating from the. He's like the Soviet Oscar Wilde in some. I know it's very different, <laughs> very different from Oscar Wilde, but still, just this. I think the Soviets hated his flamboyance, yep. uh, which which I loved at least. Um, but yeah, it was I. My first film, Kotlin Varga, was. I mean, it's n it's not anything close to what Padajanov did, but um, just the atmosphere he created. Mm. It was. Just wonderful. Um, it's really hard to put into words, but that whole region, the whole Carpathian, the mountains there, and um, okay, he filmed in in the um, what is now the Ukrainian part of the Carpathians. But I knew people in Romania, so it was a lot easier for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of cinema, it, it is. I, I, I think I called it Carpathian psychedelia. I mean, I didn't <laughs> didn't know what else to call it really. Um, it's but, you know, using orthodox imagery as well, which mm. um, is really kind of heightened, but without especially espousing the orthodox ideology. The story um, is it's very folkloric. It's, um, you know, there's a young couple and there's a forbidden love and one of them does not live. And it's about the, the, the surviving part, uh, person in that couple, how, they, how their life continues. So there's a very kind of folkloric element to it but there's this lovely um subjective poetry to it you know the way that we get to to see on screen and feel you know there's this really beautiful um just really beautiful filmmaking the way that that story is told and the way that we get to feel that story and engage with that story yeah and also just visually the the, the framing the way he used space and objects in front of the camera and mm -hmm. Um, it, was, yeah, it just blew my mind completely. Um, we should talk about Catalin because it's a it's a gorgeous um, it's a gorgeous film. We had um, a number we we uh, for the dossier at Senses of Cinema we approached writers that we were interested in working with, and I think maybe everybody <laughs> except for two or three came back instantly with Catalin. Like it was, um, it's just it's just in there. It's just in people minds and I don't think it's uh, in the sense that it's a favorite I think it's just something that when it comes to writing about that's it's um, it's a it's an extraordinarily rich film um, Alison Taylor I'm going to read this Alison Taylor sums up there's a very brief synops synopsis in her article um, which outlines the story I guess but uh, so she says Catalan Varga traces a woman's pursuit of vengeance banished from her village Catalan sets out with her young son through the Carpathians to find her rapist and Orban's, her son's biological father. Um, but it's not the what, it's the how, I think, um, that makes Catalin so, so special. And um, Sam Dayan, who we both know, a wonderful film critic, uh, she, in her article, she has this fantastic quote where she says, in Catalin Varga, the Duke of Burgundy and de Cobbler's lot, the use of landscape is more subtly ominous, often placing characters out of time and away from the mundane. Natural spaces isolate characters within their own fears or lingering traumas. And I love this almost, personification is probably too weak a word, but there's something about this idea of space um, that it ties back into the Parajanov film, you know, the mm -hmm. actual environment. It's not something as simplistic, oh, it's like it's a character, I don't, I don't mean that at all, but there's something about the power of these spaces that we really feel in, in Katalin. Um, yeah, and I think had I shown the actual rape, I think when you revisit that space, it wouldn't be as powerful. I think um, when you eliminate information for an audience, you're actually giving them a lot more. Um, I remember someone telling me about the siege in Sarajevo, and I used to see that on the television a lot in the 90s. And um, yeah, of course, it was distressing. But when someone tells you it rather than showing you it, it's um, that the thing, the, the inspiration for the whole rape came from that, mm -hmm. just from hearing someone talk. And um, 
And of course, amongst the crew, people would say, you know, why don't you have a flashback or just shoot something? Like, oh, why don't you just do that? And there was a lot of resistance. People say, oh, it's just a talking head. It's like, there's actually nothing wrong with talking heads. As long as you're aware it's a talking head, as long as the yep. intensity is there. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it was, j again, from... Um, I mean, I have no issue with showing graphic scenes, so I'm not trying to be didactic or, um, I think, you know, people might disagree, but I think when Gaspar Noe did it, he did, he did it really well. Yeah. But I think for this particular film, it needed to be done that way. And um, almost like a reversal, so when you see full, full nudity, it, it's the rapist being nude, not the woman, uh, whereas usually it's the other way around. Um, but, um, but yeah, that was 17 days. So it was um, the, the very whole much the whole shoot. The whole shoot, 17 days. Yeah. Wow. yeah. No, but in, in a weird way, it kind of worked because I think all the actors were friends because they all came from the same theatre or theatre groups. So they mm. all had the same the methods of arriving at a scene. When you look at different actors from different schooling kind of backgrounds, it can be a nightmare. But um, there was a lot of trust, um, and because we had a really small crew, it was like. 11 of us in the crew. Mm -hmm. It's just fewer people to feed, fewer people yeah. to move around. Uh, so you can just do things really quick. We, we, I mean, we were very basic, so it's quite a crude film. So we didn't have tracks, we didn't have steady cams, mm -hmm. we had a tripod, and that was it. Um, three lamps. So it's pretty kind of like, you know, almost like an old blues record in that kind of crudeness of recording. Um, that kind but of fits with the film too, in that they have mobile phones, but they're on a horse and cart. Well, that was you Romania. Know, it's lovely, back then. Yeah. lovely, sort of present and past coming together in a very natural way. But that was yeah. In two, I mean, I haven't been to Romania in a long time now. But when we shot it in two thousand and six, mm -hmm. that was Romania, mm -hmm. uh, which I was aware it could be used as something quite interesting. But um, it was completely natural to see that. Yeah. And it, uh, what was so interesting for me was when we shot it. It was the year before they joined the EU, so we. I shouldn't say this, but there was so, many, so much paperwork just to bring the equipment, and I just didn't fill out the paperwork for the actual film stock. So I had 54 cans of 16 mil in my in my huge set of backpacks, and um, we took the night train back to Hungary to get it developed. And I was so scared a border guard would just, oh. you know, what's in those cans? And luckily, no one stopped us. But um, but it's just odd that we were in the EU back then, and Romania was the outsider, and now. We're going to be the outsider. How about that? <laughs> um, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. I had no idea how I was going to segue to the next film, but you've just laid it out for me. Speaking of outsiders, let's talk about Paul Morrissey's Trash. Oh, yeah. I love that <laughs> um, film. Yeah. We, I think, both had the experience of discovering this film when we were younger as a quote-unquote Andy Warhol Presents that was sort of branded very heavily with the Andy Warhol producer mm -hmm. label. Um, some of you guys might have seen this, some of you may have not. For those of you who don't know Paul Morrissey or the, this trilogy of Heat, Flesh and Trash, um, Trash in particular, you actually know more than you think. If you know Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side, we've got Little Joe and we've got Holly. This is, this is the kind of the, the inspiration for that. Um, and also, the what's the Rolling Stones cover? Sticky Fingers. Is, oh, that's um, Alessandro's crotch, that's, isn't that's it? That's his yeah. bits, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so if you know those things, you're already halfway onto this film. I adore these films. I was so thrilled to see that you had um, selected this. They are grotty and there's so much energy to them. I had a friend describe them. Um, they're, they're fictional films ostensibly, but he described them um, as a documentary series on the most beautiful man in the world's terrible skin. Um, Joe D'Alessandro is a god and these films are just him as a, as a, just, he's a junkie and he's completely disconnected and, and Trash is, it's beautiful, I'm, I'm going to quote you again, I hope you don't mind, it's, I love Trash for its mischief, playful ambiguity regarding gender and sexuality and warmth for its characters and these are, you know, these are like the, the bottom of the bottom, like these are really kind of people at the, um, yeah, the, these are sort of, junkies and, and, and sex workers and and there's so much joy and tragedy and I mean I just think these are wild films tell me about trash um I, I, <laughs> I it just I, 
think it's just the performances. Holly and Joe together, just the complete opposites. But um, I, li I love them both for, for very different reasons. But um, it was just, I just love the fact that you know, Holly's trans, but that never really came into it. It was really radical, and that's kind of how it should be. And I remember she did an interview, um, well, she, because I, I, got, I got to know Holly um, years later, but... She was in your... In my first short gum? film, yeah, yeah, yeah. But she did this interview, and someone asked her, yeah, are you a man, are you a woman, are you... What are you? And she said, oh, you know, what does it matter, as long as you look fabulous, and... Um, but, you know, back then, I think things were really progressive. You know, I remember Fass, a bit, 10 years later, but or maybe less than that, Fassbinder with um, Fox and his friends. Mm -hmm. He brings his boyfriend home for dinner. But there's no mention of it's a boyfriend. It's just they're having dinner. And isn't that just wonderful? But it doesn't have to come up. Um, so I, I liked it a lot for that. I, mean, I, I just love the aesthetic. I mean, I love the, the, the grit, the quality of the actual film. Um, the recording methods were like Casavetes, that there was no artifice to the recording. It was pure street sound and everything, but it just worked, really. Um, it's probably um, what you'd call problematic now, but the seduction scene with Holly and this schoolboy, when she basically she basically injects him with heroin and gives him a blowjob, um, which I guess wouldn't... Yeah, you'd get some articles about that now. The, but, the um, Guardian would call it yeah, problematic. Um, <laughs> They became lovers in no real life, to those two. But um, yeah, <laughs> but, um, did they really? In real yeah, life? in real life, I they became really lovers. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I just Holly hadn't done that much since Trash. She did Broken Goddess and I think Woman in Revolt mm -hmm. for Morrissey again. Um, a few other bits and bobs. She did some show stuff like with Divine on stage and John Sex, people like that. Um, but yeah, it was actually really easy to kind of work with her. She was around and um so bubblegum you also worked with nick zed is that yeah, right that, yeah. that kind of takes us i guess to this cinema of transgression we're not going to get mm. through all of the shorts because i do want to leave some time for q a but um one of the shorts these are on tonight by the way um the strickland se selections of short films at 9 p.m and they're just it's just a just a really strong um series of short films that that you've chosen they're wonderful but i have to start with Submit to Me, the Richard Kern film. Um, so the whole cinema of transgression thing is, I went back to my old Death Tripping, the old Jack oh, yeah, Sargent yeah. book, yeah. Um, and you're in there. I saw your name in there. I'm in the amended version. Oh, I have Not the first one. I'm not no, old no, school. No, I thought no, I was no, old yeah. school. Oh. <laughs> well, it was nice to see you in there. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not really a transgressive film what I did, but yeah, it's nice to be in there. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> so Submit to Me is... Um, <laughs> Is pretty well. I'm going to give you guys the IMDb description compared to the Richard Kern description. So IMDb says a no wave erotic horror exploring the aesthetics of kink, sadism, mutilation, and suicide. <laughs> Richard Kern says that his inspiration for the film was I remembered how movies looked to me when I was. <laughs> Can I swear? Is this going out live? I, no, I can't swear. Um, <laughs> All right, you've had the warning to bleep this out. I remember how movies looked to me when I was fucked up on acid, <laughs> which should be the IMDb version. Um, it's basically like a little series. It's a short film. There's um, this amazing soundtrack, I think, from The Butthole Surface. It is, Butthole Surface. I think Fetus comes in at the end, but um, the butthole, it's um, Cherub by The Butthole Surface, yeah. Yep. Um, and it's the... Uh, I mean, everybody's in it. Clint, you know, J.G. Thurwell slash, I think, Clint Ruin, he mm. was... You know, Lydia Lunch, my of queen, course, was in yeah. it. Um, I think Sonic Youth get a credit for actually being in it. Are they in it? I know Thurston Moore was on the soundtrack for the second Submit to right. Me. Um, Tommy Turner is in it, as always. Um, Lung Leg, because the, the, the cover, the, the sleeve to, to Evil by Sonic Youth, that's from Submit to Me, mm -hmm. which is how I discovered that film, really. It's just, I mean, it's, it's so raw and so wild, and, it, and this film was made in the same year that... Um, the Cinema of Transgression <laughs> Manifesto was written, so this was like this really vital moment that just sort of exploded. How did how did how did bubblegum happen? How did how did you get all these amazing people oh, in bubblegum? The phone book, if I'm honest. Um, What's a phone is, book? I <laughs> know. Uh, it was an amazing time. I mean I was I was a complete outsider. I, I had no connections whatsoever. I had um well no I'll tell a lie. There was the BFI film and television handbook which cost like fifteen pounds, then the phone book which which is free. Um, 
So there was a documentary on the, the Lou Reed track, Walk, Walk on the Wild Side, which actually I never really liked that track, but, but I loved the people it was portraying. Mm -hmm. So Holly was in it. So I called the production company who gave me James Marsh's number, who's now a film director. Um, he gave me Holly's agent's number. I got hold of Holly. Um, then I went to stay with my aunt in Woodhaven in Queens, used the phone book there. I got the London film, not the London, New York Filmmakers Co-op number. So I met M.M. Sarah, who introduced me to this guy called Johannes Schoenher, introduced me to Todd Phillips, another bizarre thing, because he's now a film director. Um, introduced me, it goes on and on, Richard Kern and then Nick Zed. So it happened really organically. Um, but it was amazing for me, because I, I was a film school reject. I, um, I'd only done like a few Super 8 films. I was from the suburbs, you know, middle class, a bit shy. Um, but I know, I think as long as you're just honest and just say, you know, this is my background and don't pretend to be, you know, I could have pretended to be a junkie, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the middle class junkie, but, um, <laughs> which, believe me, a lot of people try and do that. Um, but yeah, people were just fantastic, really welcoming. And Nick, I was kind of terrified of him at the beginning, but he was a, he was a sweetheart. Uh, I mean, Holly was, I mean, I don't want to speak badly of the dead. Um, Holly had issues. Um, she was, could be glorious and wonderful company. Um, but she had a lot of, I remember, she was not on the plane. You know, I paid for her to fly from LA to New York. This is before mobile phones, you know, just not there. And you call her home, she's not there. Went missing for three days and then... Oh, wow. You know, she'd have these periods of mystery, if you put it that way. Um, she stayed with me and my aunt in Queens. I never told my aunt about the whole trans thing, so my aunt didn't even know. Um, but it was amazing to have this person I remember from my childhood, not childhood, sorry, not but in my teen years, you know, staying with my aunt in Queens. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, but yeah, it was... So, I mean, I'm not really, you know, the film itself was like my film school. Yep. That was the best way to learn film. I made a load of mistakes. It's not a great film, but it was an experience. Um, the whole thing, from just getting the nuts and bolts to even festivals and so on. I think because of Holly, we got into festivals, so that was right. quite an experience. We got into Berlin. Um, but then there was like a massive gap, because it was so expensive. This was 16 mil. So even with editing, you'd have to hire this six-plate Steenbeck. Mm -hmm. It's like Avid, where you can, you know, go to someone's place and use it. Um, so it's like six or so years of not making anything on 16 mil, at least. I did a few Super 8 things. I love that that's your first baby, and Holly's in it. That's lovely. No, it's, <laughs> gr it's wonderful, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I saw her afterwards. She came to Berlin mm. for that showing, and we kind of made up. Because, yeah, we kind of... She was a bit Jekyll and Hyde sometimes. She could turn on you for the smallest thing, and, but then be absolutely adorable and wonderful and sweet. That's lovely. Look, we're going to... Kind of like trash, actually. She's kind of similar in trash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seeing her in trash, you kind of get the idea, r roughly, you know. But anyway. That, that film, I, I just love trash. I she love the women. In, I mean, the, the, you know, the women in it are just... They're these little vignettes and they're just these wild women. And, and poor Joe, this super handsome man <laughs> who's completely impotent. Um, and everybody wants him, and it, it, he's just so detached. <laughs> like he just—they're warm and they're sad and they're funny and they're heart-wrenching. It's beautiful. She was in jail the night before the premiere of Trash. I think they had to kind of bail her out. But anyway, <laughs> um. Um, we had some other shorts that I was going to go through, but we're run out of time. But you guys can go along tonight and see them because they're all amazing. <coughs> um, because we didn't have uh, a Q and A after in Fabric last night, I thought that we would. See if anybody had anything to ask Peter. Now we have some awesome volunteers who everybody should be nice to because they do such amazing work. Um, if you've got a question for Peter, please, you know what to do. You don't need me to give you instructions. Um, I have a craft question. I don't know how you feel about craft questions, but... Um, Stylistically, all your films hang together for me, but also it's the performances in your films. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about how you work with your actors and how you prep them um, to give these performances that sit at this lovely edge of 
reality and artifice? I think it depends on the film. With, within fabric, it was done with numbers. Like, I'm not very good at talking sometimes, and because um, I, I never trained formally with actors, so um, it uh, so it was a kind of adjusting to the space you're in. So, like, let's say if. Zero is like a Mike Lee film or Ken Loach. It was never on Zero, but one would be so vaguely social realist, like The House and so on. Ten would be completely whacked out, which I wouldn't have, but maybe number nine for the store. The bank would be number five. So, you know, like some Marin, she wouldn't re she wouldn't really modulate her performance according to the space, but she'd just be aware of the different rhythm or the different energy and so on. Um, I play music a lot to actors. I mean, from the Duke onwards, I was doing that a lot. Um, especially for the, you know, for the, I mean, sometimes even when we shoot, I'm playing music. Because it often conveys things I can't put into words. And I know Sitsa loved it. She really, really keyed into it. And Marion loved it. I actually played her, um, Demis Roussos sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was her favorite. Um, but really, uh, it's actually, I find it in a way quite hard when you've written something. It's like explaining your own language to someone. I can probably explain Hungarian better, even though I don't speak much Hungarian at all. I could explain it better than I, c I could w with English. Because i kind of grown up with that script. So I, it's very hard to unglue myself. So when actors ask questions, it's like, oh my God, you know, because I'm like, come on, I don't, why are you asking this? And I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Well, you know, I didn't. So sometimes I'm so involved that I'm not really stepping back from it. Um, but you know, I think as long as they ask me a question, <laughs> I'm going to give them an answer. But I'm quite bad, actually actively saying, you know, what about this, what about that? Um, but luckily I've worked, you know, like a Marianne, she's so natural that, um, and I think with Fatma, there's like this shorthand now, um, quite often we don't even talk, we just, you know, if something is not working, we'll talk about it, but um, I think we're kind of on the same wavelength to some degree. But yeah, it's um, I mean, it's you know, with each film, it's, it's different, and with each, with each actor, it's different. I remember one film. I don't want to name the actors because I think it's a bit unfair. But um, one actor hated talking about blocking. I'm quite into you know where the actor's standing and the camera in, in relation to that. I, said, I don't want to talk about it. You know, let's talk about the words, and then organically the movement will come from the words. It's like okay, fine, no problem. But the other actor, with the actor, was all about movement and blocking. Forget the words. I'm not interested. So. They're completely different starting points. So in my head, I was just tossing a coin. Okay, right, it's that this actor's turn, and then <laughs> so there was, you know, you always get a bit, a tiny bit, of, <laughs> tiny bit of sulking going on on set. So yeah, <laughs> not that I ever sulk, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? One at the front. Hi, thanks both of you. I really enjoyed that. Um, in Berberian. Um, sound studio, there's this wonderful passage where you leap to Box Hill and there's this, you know, clipped Englishy voice talking about the countryside and then we're back in the studio. Uh, when I saw that, um, I got so excited I had to like rewind my computer and like watch the section again because I think I needed to breathe. But what was really interesting to me was that we're in this kind of artificial, clipped up, dark, boxed in world of the sound studio, which was also nightmare -y. And then <laughs> normally what I would find nightmare is this kind of generic video, but it was where the oxygen was in the film for me. And I wondered when you make films, do you, um, because to me you have a natural sense of the poetic, um, uh, do you, uh, sorry, I'm, it's hard finishing this question because I've got like 10 questions, but anyway. Um, do you think a lot about what you're doing or do you write when you write your scripts, assuming you write your scripts down or scribble your ideas down, do you break and think about that and think about layering the montage or is it just more poetic and instinctive with you? It's quite intuitive, really. Um, so I don't write treatments. Um, I've done one recently for a kid's film because it was a bigger budget and they wanted a treatment, but with this kind of soft money I've been very lucky to get. Um, I just write the script and find it, then I write the treatment based on the script. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've never been, I did fine art at uni and I was so bad at theory and I, I always struggled with it and I, 
I don't know. Um, so for, it's a hard one because obviously sometimes if you go in too much into in, into intuition, it can almost become like a bit of a cop out, almost contrived. And I think you still need this kind of connection to something or other. Um, but no, usually with my films, I I just find it and yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's so kind of much. Mm. The what, sorry? Rotten, oh, well, all still lives are kind of dying, aren't they? But Oh, um, right, yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you always, like, still life seems to be a thing with you, or maybe it's just because it's a thing with me that I see it in your films, but uh, it, was a, yeah. it was a lovely moment for me in the film last night when I saw the, the, the dress, dress moves <laughs> and there's the still life that's all completely mouldy. There's no commerce in it. Uh, yeah, I remember that, because we did that as a second unit, and um, I specifically... Oh, I remember that, yeah, no, it's a bit of a painful one because we shot it in London and in Europe they have celeriac. I even had it last night as part of the festival dinner. We had like celeriac pasta. And in Britain, they just chop it up really badly. So I, I ordered celeriac for the, for, the, for the basket and it came up in this very cuby like structure. And I was like, no, you want the real thing, just like this HR Geiger vegetable. <laughs> um, so I was in a, actually I was in a sulk over that. Um, <laughs> actually I was sulking a lot in, in fabric. Um, but so but we, when we did the second unit, we had to do it in Hungary, so we had to kind of match it. And I I never felt because in Bavarian we got really good rotten vegetables, um, but it had to do that. You know, I mean the, the dress, yeah, of course it had to kind of decompose the vegetables. But thank you for noticing that. It could have <laughs> been it could have been a better moment if we had, um, yeah. We probably have time for one last very quick question if anybody's feeling lucky. Do it. Um, if it's a quick question, I note uh, uh, you thanked Guy Madden in the credits of In oh. Fabric. I'm just wondering what the connection there was. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say, really. Um, he helped with an actor that we couldn't get in the end. I can't name the actor, but um, there was an actor we wanted, and Guy Madden... Well, I'm, I know Guy, and Guy knows this actor, and he tried to kind of intervene because the agent was being a bit tricky. Um, Guy did his best, didn't quite work out, but, you know, he put a lot of effort in to kind of convince this actor. Um, so, yeah. Just one more quick question. Stylistically as well, um, both of you kind of have that um, taking of a certain feel of an era of cinema and injecting your own brains into it, so I, I thought maybe it was... No, because he does it a hundred times better. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, you can't match what he does. It's just mind-blowing. Um, you do all right, thank Peter. You. you do all uh, right. Well, no, come on, seriously, his films are... I mean, that's like a whole kind of different thing. But, um, but He gave, I mean, beer legs. He gave us beer legs, the glass legs with the beer. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, that's like top shelf for me. <laughs> Thank you all for coming along this afternoon. Please join me in thanking Peter Strickland for spending some time with us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really hope that... I really hope you can get to some, um, obviously, some more of Peter's films, um, especially if you haven't seen them. Even if you have seen them before, you may not have seen them big and glorious. Um, but especially the, the films that Peter has selected. We didn't get through them all, but they're all little weird treasures. Thank you for choosing them. Thank you. Enjoy Thanks. the festival, everybody. Thank Thanks, Peter.